The following content is meant purely for educational and informational purposes and should not be relied upon as financial, investment, legal, tax, or any other professional advice. This is the Fundamentals Podcast, where we demystify crypto and help you navigate this ever-evolving internet native economy. In this episode, we're joined by Renick Pally, the founding partner at Stratos, a fund that seeds the future of crypto. Stratus focuses on both venture, where they invest in DeFi and Web3 companies, and infra, where they provide the hardware, stake, and expertise that helps blockchains grow. We discuss Stratos, their investment strategy, and how they approach the market. We then move on to speak about the execution layer landscape and dive into valuing layer one and layer two blockchains and what the main differences in valuation methodologies are between the two. We cover topics including monetary premium, staking ratio, real staking yield, positive economic balance, and intrinsic value. We draw parallels between tokens and more traditional assets, and speak about applying comparative valuation concepts to crypto. We speak about the current lack of value accrual mechanisms for L2 tokens, and what the future could look like on that front. Finally, we touch on the current state of the blockchain market, and what keeps Stratus optimistic about the future. So tune in for a great discussion about how Renick and Stratus approach the space. Hello, Renick. Welcome to the Fundamentals Podcast. It is great to have you on. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. I've been enjoying your blog posts lately. Did a pretty thorough deep dive into them. And today we're going to be especially diving into kind of the execution layer landscape and how you guys look at valuing L1s and L2s, because I think you have some great takes on that front. But before we dive into these topics, it would be great if you can give us an overview of Stratus. So kind of the story behind how you came to be and how you approach the space. Yep. So we have two primary funds. One is a combination of venture and liquids, obviously in the crypto space. And then our second fund is pure venture, early stage. And we plan to have more funds in the future that mimic the second fund. So we kind of play in both spaces, both on the liquid side and on the venture side, but our focus is really making long-term investments at the very early stage. As the space evolves and there becomes more liquid opportunities that we think are going to be drivers of alpha, which I'm sure we can talk about more today, we'll become more active on the liquid side. And of course, pretty much every early stage venture fund in crypto that is investing in tokens ultimately winds up with the liquid portfolio. So to some degree, you know, everyone does kind of what I was describing, but we kind of have two distinct buckets for those two things. Yeah. Awesome. And how would you describe the core problem that Stratus solves for LPs? As you mentioned that a lot of funds in this space, many of them start with doing venture, end up doing liquid venture as well. So they have those two baskets. So how do you kind of differentiate yourselves within this market? Yeah. So I would say that Our focus, as we'll talk about today, we're really focused on the network side of things. We invest less in dApps and quote unquote, like Web3 than some of the other venture funds in the space. We're also really focused on very early stage investments with a pretty clear focus on low valuations coming in really at the first fundraising round. Typically we lead rounds. And so when you take that all together and you, you compare that to our fund sizes, which are you know on the smaller side for crypto venture, we really are a pretty precise exposure for LPs rather than like a, a really large fund that gets kind of like broad market crypto exposure. We try to be very convicted in what we do and very early. And so the goal is you know to go to an LP and say, the exposure that you're going to get by investing in one of the Stratos venture funds is very unique relative to other venture funds in the space just because of the niche that we're focused in, the valuation we come in at, the ownership percentages that we get when we lead those early stage rounds, and then you know the size of the fund that those types of exposures are in. So there's, there's really only a handful of funds that we know of that do similar things. Got it. That sounds great. Now, before we dive into the specifics of valuing L1s, I want to ask a higher level question about the execution layer landscape and a topic that everyone is pretty much well aware of. It's the fact that the vast majority of non-Bitcoin crypto asset value consists of L1 and L2 tokens. But I think a less spoken about side of that is 
what the implications are for an investor that most of the value is tied to this very small subset of assets. So how do you take this into account when thinking about investment opportunities in the space? I think that's like one of the most interesting questions in crypto. So happy to dive into it. I think it would be helpful for me just to give a little bit of background on myself, just because I think it helps give some context into why I see the world this way and why my perspective on this might be different or unique from maybe some of the others uh, that might be commenting on the same phenomenon. So my background is in engineering and applied math. And then I study how to be a quant basically. So using statistics to try and analyze stock movements and uh, predict how prices might move in the future. And then I, I worked at a very large, primarily long only investment firm that invested in global equities. So looking at public stocks around the world and really with the value mindset, which is to say, you know, going out, doing deep fundamental research on these companies and trying to find opportunities where you could invest in dollars for 50 cents. And, you know, it's kind of the Warren Buffett mindset. And the reason for that is, you know, if you can find something, a company that's producing cash flow and you can become really confident in the level of those cash flows, then you can start to see things that the rest of the market doesn't really see because the market tends to be very short-term oriented and driven by events as opposed to what the real underlying fundamentals are of a company or an industry. And it's actually those kind of long-term fundamentals that really drive stock price movements over the long term. And so like the essence of that is trying to break the world down and say, like, what are the real drivers of this economic activity and try and figure those things out and then build the portfolio around that to get exposure to those bigger ideas. And obviously you'd express it in more of a micro sense on a position by position basis, but it was always kind of informed by this broader view of how money was made and how moats were created in businesses and, you know, how you could generate long-term returns. And so that is kind of the same mindset that myself and the team at Stratos are taking to these questions. And that's why we've spent a lot of time researching some of these ideas, because we think these big ideas are the things that will dominate long-term returns in crypto and will end up being the most important things to really get right. So just to, to continue with your question specifically, what are the implications for an investor in terms of the, you know, basically 85% of the non-stablecoin crypto value is in Bitcoin, Ethereum, the other L1s and L2s. So what's going on there? Well, let's hold L2s aside for a second because they're kind of their own thing. What's going on with the L1s? It's this idea of monetary premium, which is to say that each one of these L1 networks issues a token and that token behaves more like money, or at least the market perceives it to be more like money than a financial asset. And so if you break down the world of assets, crypto or not, you basically have two broad categories. You have monetary assets and then financial assets. And a monetary asset is something that is intended to store value generally is scarce or semi-scarce. And then you really derive value from that based on network effects, how many people hold that currency, how many people are willing to transact in that thing, what do other people perceive the value of that to be today and what will it be in the future? And then financial assets, which are things like stocks, where you can say it's generating 10% free cash flow yield, and thus it should be valued as a function of that future cash flow. And you can see basically the crypto world in a nutshell bifurcating around these two asset types. So all of the value in crypto basically comes from these monetary premium assets. And then a very small percentage of the value today comes from what are really more like financial assets, which are the tokens that are associated with dApps or decentralized applications. So basically decentralized applications will converge to look more and more like companies and tech companies, SaaS companies, financial companies, et cetera. 
and then they will be built on top of the networks that issue tokens that look more and more like money or a, you know a derivative of money. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think that is also kind of a key takeaway that I took from your blockchain economics article that you put out is the fact that yes, the intrinsic value of any financial asset is defined by its future cash flows, but when you look at L1 tokens that are not one-dimensional assets in any way, they'll likely never be priced as discounted cash flow type assets. But instead, by a combination of different financial asset value through monetary premium, staking yield, positive economic balance, and other concepts that you mentioned in the article. So starting with the concept of monetary premium, could you speak about its significance in a bit more detail? in the context of L1 blockchains, what factors drive monetary premium there? So monetary premium is something that's a little bit hard to define. You know, you can use it to describe a lot of different phenomena of different asset types. In the context of L1s, it's a little bit easier to define because you can look at what the revenue multiple is that L1s trade at versus a DAP or another type of asset. And what basically you find is that they, they, they trade at, you know, a thousand X revenue multiple, if not higher. And one could say, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has monetary premium. It just means that this thing is hugely overvalued. And, and that's a fair argument, but we think that there's a lot more going on with these L1s that drives them to be valued in this way that isn't just a function of being, you know, a bubble or being overvalued and I think everything that's happened in the last couple of years from a macro perspective that has driven asset prices down generally and crypto prices clearly down, you know, from 3 trillion to 1.1 trillion today and yet these things it's basically been the perfect storm to collapse crypto asset prices and yet they still sustain. So what's going on there? So to define monetary premium, really, you have to see a couple of things that are prevalent or existent in that L1. So the first thing is sovereignty. Sovereignty is a term that gets used in crypto a lot that is typically used by devs to describe the architecture of a blockchain. But it's also relevant in an economic sense. And it's similar to this idea that any country, any, any nation can be sovereign, which is to say they have their own currency. They have their own economic system that they control. They have a central bank. They issue a currency. They issue bonds. They have a capital account with other countries outside of themselves, but they within themselves are sovereign. And blockchains can be viewed in a similar lens where, for example, if you're Bitcoin or Ethereum, it is the code base of that blockchain that defines the issuance of the tokens and also the validators that support that blockchain network are paid in that token as well. So the entire monetary system of that blockchain is sovereign. It's not dependent on the monetary policy of US dollars or euros or, or yen. It's, it's its own thing. Or even Ethereum's monetary policy is not a function of Bitcoins. Whereas, you know, if you think about every company that exists within the United States that issues stock, their business strategy, their business itself really transacts in dollars. You don't see Amazon bucks being used to buy things on their website in the same way that you would you do actually have that happening with ethereum and so that's you know in simple terms a concept of sovereignty and so then what people have begun to appreciate in these sovereign networks is that their sovereignty does create money and not all money is created equal but because there are these other features like plausible scarcity and positive economic balances and staking yields for the proof of stake networks, you can start to look at these things and understand what the balance sheet of these networks kind of is, right? And so if you look today at the US dollar and, and this meme that is starting to crop up around, you know, the fact that 
it's possibly unsustainable where the dollar is today because of the amount that the government is spending and the amount of outstanding debt and the interest cost to finance that debt. All of those things eventually will wind up in a place, some people think, that becomes unsustainable for the U.S. government. And it will keep third parties offshore from wanting to actually own U.S. dollars and treasuries. And so then you can compare that to something like Ethereum and say, well, actually, Ethereum is theoretically ultrasound money. It is both plausibly scarce in that they're not issuing more, but it's actually becoming deflationary because the number of ETH floating is actually declining as a function of the economic activity on that chain. And so if you have something that you can be certain around its scarcity and is accessible globally and can be used for actually transacting on a day-to-day -day basis, you could start to build this idea that this thing can function as money just as well as a fiat currency can. And so that starts to build up this mythology, if you will, around how crypto tokens become money and thus that drives them to be valued, not as financial assets, but as monetary assets. And then the holders of those assets don't necessarily care what their revenue multiple is because that's not necessarily what they hold them for in the first place. Got it. That is a really great overview. But then if we think about the actual revenues that these networks can generate in ETH's case, it's the amount of ETH that gets burned in each transaction. Would you say that when an investor looks at a network like that, the importance of the revenue is more related to its function in the positive economic balance instead of just purely looking at it on its own? So I think the function of revenue in a layer one network, particularly a proof of stake network, does impact the value of that token, but it, it does so indirectly because of what you just mentioned, which is this idea of economic balance. How we define economic balance is you have revenue coming in from gas fees, and then you have expenses going out to pay validators to support the network. So if you live in a place as a network where you're paying more to your validators than you're taking in in gas fees, you have to make up that gap somehow. And you do that by inflation, by issuing more tokens than what you're actually earning in fees. And so if that delta gets out of hand, you start to get into this place where your token is no longer plausibly scarce, which is a term we use that is, is kind of uh, amorphous in terms of like, where is the actual boundary on what becomes plausibly scarce and what then eventually is not. And it's kind of, well, does the market believe that the inflation rate is low enough relative to the growth rate and demand in that particular token or on that network that it's not too high and it's not diluting the existing holders too much. The level of what that number is, no one really knows. The way that currencies kind of collapse is very slowly and then all of a sudden. And so, you know, that happens in crypto. We've seen it many times. But, you know, by and large, if you can have a low inflation rate or ideally a negative inflation rate, like what we have with Ethereum, you create plausible scarcity because you know how many tokens exist. And so that revenue is one side of that equation. The security budget, which is what you have to pay to validators to actually support the network is the other side. Definitely. And I think the positive economic balance, it's a great framework that you use. And I've used the term economic sustainability when I spoke about this topic with a lot of the L1 founders to ask them on how, how important they find it to be. And it's quite interesting to see how the answers differ between network. And of course, we need to understand that I think it's only Ethereum and Tron at the moment that have like a positive economic balance. When you look at L1s, everyone else is inflating a lot more tokens than they are actually burning or generating in any kind of revenue out there at the moment. Now, what I'll say though, is it's not necess it's not a strict requirement. Like positive economic balance is not a strict requirement for monetary premium. And you see that in things like Solana and Bitcoin. They both have negative economic balances, but you know me the mechanics for that are different. But in both cases, the market still views them as 
money because there's still a plausible level of scarcity, right? The inflation rate is not too high. With Bitcoin, everyone knows that there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. Soul is different, right? It's going to continue to inflate. But then there's this other question of, well, how do you bootstrap security? You have to pay validators to create the security, which is the first step in the sort of flywheel of building an L1 ecosystem. Then you need DApp developers, you need an airdrop for them. You need fees to be cheap enough for users. So you want to keep those costs low. So it's, it's completely understandable and rational that an L1 design would start in the early years, maybe in the early decades with a negative economic balance for the reasons that I mentioned, but still would be able to be viewed and be viewed by the market as, as money. Definitely. And that was a great addition there because I think one comparison that I've liked to draw between like layer one networks is to nation states. And there are many nation states out there generating a fiscal surplus, but they've still been up and running for quite a long time. So kind of using that as a bridge to drive into drawing parallels between L1 tokens and existing more traditional assets such as sovereign currencies. Could you speak about the country theory of L1s, what that is, and how you think it could be applied to valuing L1s? This is a fun one because you can draw so many parallels between blockchain networks and countries that you know you, you could kind of go on and on and on and keep unraveling layers of the onion. But the way I look at that at a high level is... Sovereign blockchains are similar to sovereign nations for the reason I mentioned earlier about how if you issue your own currency and you control your monetary policy and you have some trading interactions with other countries, you're sovereign while well, blockchains are the same. And, and you know, I think people sometimes really kind of scratch their heads at this analogy, but I don't actually think it's that far-fetched because blockchains are the only economically motivated systems that are extra physical. They just exist on the internet and they're accessible to everyone around the world that humans have ever really had, right? So we've kind of anchored ourselves on this idea that countries are a physical thing that exists within a border that have security via a physical military rather than, you know, a distributed validator network. But I think in the future, this will become more and more accepted as, you know, maybe not a replacement for traditional governments and physical sovereign nations, but as an addition or an alternative to that that exists on the internet. And so when you think about what a blockchain can be, and I think Ethereum and Bitcoin are both like almost diametrically opposed in this sense, but they're both like these living communities that are self-sustaining. Bitcoin in the sense that it that community is extremely focused on maintaining the original intent and keeping it simple. And Ethereum with the community really led by Vitalik is focused on continuous improvement of the function of that blockchain and becoming more and more usable for a broader swath of the population. And in both cases though, these things become self-sustaining because of the way that the currency, that token that they issue, coordinates those communities and that population around it. And so it's completely feasible that these blockchains will exist over a multi-decade timescale, if not potentially longer. And so when you start asking yourself the question of, well, Ethereum has been around for what, eight years now, what happens if it's around for 40 years? What's it going to look like? And yeah, it's going to face competition and there are going to be challenges. I'm not saying it's a guarantee that it gets there, but if you just imagine, well, what does it look like 40 years from now and how developed could it be and how big could the economy be and how many massive applications could be living there and what value of the world's assets might live there? It's a pretty interesting question. And then it helps you start to think about things in this sort of country theory terms. So I'll get into the economics of that next, but I'll pause for now. Comparison between L1s and countries is definitely one of my favorite ones to make because you can find so many similarities there. And if we do move on to the economics of that, when we consider other comparative valuation 
concepts like the one we just spoke about. You also mention Blockspace purchasing power parity as another one in your article. Can you speak about what that is? Okay, so there's this thing called the Big Mac Index that The Economist publishes every year, which basically says like in currency adjusted terms, in dollar terms, how much does a Big Mac cost in every country in the world? Which is basically to say, once you adjust for the foreign exchange rate differences, what does it actually cost to buy a Big Mac in dollar terms? And the, the reason why that's interesting is because it takes into account the actual costs of producing that in that country. What is the cost of beef? What is the cost of labor? What is the cost to rent the real estate for the McDonald's to be at? And so when you start to look at that and say, well, how does that work in crypto? If you assume that there are no frictions between moving between blockchains, which there certainly are, which is the same thing with the Big Mac index, you're assuming there's no friction to get from the United States to Zimbabwe to be able to buy a Big Mac. It's just interesting to compare. You can look at a sort of a set of transaction types that are common, and you can compare what they cost in that local native currency in each one of these blockchains, and then start to say, okay, well, relative to if I were to strip out the valuation differences of these native tokens and just say, well, what would be the Ethereum-based cost of doing this trade on Solana, for example? What is the cost, the implied cost of the block space there versus another place? And so then it starts to get into this question of, well, are gas fees too high? Should gas fees be lower? Or actually, are gas fees, are they supposed to be high? Because the higher gas fees makes it easier to have a sustainable economic balance. And thus, you can pay your validators more. And so in that case, it's, it's actually a very plausible argument that higher gas fees are better for the network because it creates more security. And so that's just premium block space. And so block space maybe is not a perfect commodity in the same way that you know a Big Mac is. And so it's, it's kind of a, an interesting exploration of, okay, well, what is the nature of block space across different blockchains? And is it really perfectly comparable or not? Or does different types of block space have different use cases? Yeah, for sure. And going back uh, a bit to the components that make up the actual value of a blockchain network, one pretty interesting one that you refer to in your article is intrinsic value, but separating it into both real intrinsic value and speculative intrinsic value. So can you kind of walk me through the difference between the real and speculative intrinsic value and what role speculative value plays as a component there? Yeah, I mean, we we define these two terms, real intrinsic value and speculative intrinsic value, as a way to try and kind of compare or create a market of L1s and how they're priced. So basically, we said, okay, what is the staking yield I can generate on ETH? And okay, if that's 4%, let's pretend that that is equivalent to the risk-free rate of crypto staking yields. It's the blue chip, you know, it's like owning treasuries. Well, then if that yield is what is required for me to want to stake anything, then I'm going to stake Ethereum and I'm going to earn 4%. But then if I want to go stake on Solana or, you know, one of the other longer tail chains, I assume, we assume that that staker would want to earn a higher yield. And that higher yield is compensation for additional risk. It's compensation potentially for, you know, when I say this, I mean real yield. They want to earn a higher real yield because in some cases, the nominal yield like in Solana is much higher than Ethereum. But then when you account for the fact that some of that yield is being inflated away, the real yield is actually lower. And so the question is, well, if you were to take all of the stake that could be supported by the minimum real yield, which is what you earn on Ethereum in other networks, that defines the real intrinsic value. And then the, the value of, of staked assets above that makes up for the speculative intrinsic value. And then the value above that again is the monetary premium. 
you know, th- this is almost, this is like two middle curves, honestly. This is just something that we tried to do to try and like rationally and analytically wrap our heads around these different staking yields. But I think actually what in the future will define pricing more closely, I think is block space purchasing power parity across networks. Now, when you speak about these factors that make it easier for a blockchain to achieve that economic balance or sustainability, and thinking that in the market, most blockchains still haven't reached that state. Of course, they're early and a lot of them don't need to get to a positive economic balance. Could you still shed a bit of light on the factors that make achieving kind of the long-term sustainability so challenging for L1s? I think Ethereum has created this problem for other blockchains. So side note, I think Vitalik has done an exceptional job at cultivating an image as being sort of neutral and wanting to see crypto overall grow and, and succeed. And I think he, he wants that definitely, but he still wants Ethereum to win. And so there's a lot of things when you start to look at the world from that lens of, well, is Vitalik really completely altruistic or does he actually want Ethereum to win? And when you look at some of the design choices of Ethereum, you start to see, well, actually, Ethereum has really benefited by being a first mover and in some ways has kind of shut the door behind it for other blockchains to catch up. And so one of those things comes from the level of gas fees on Ethereum. People always complain about the, how high gas fees are on Ethereum. And you know, in the last bull run, the whole argument for the existence of every other alt L1 was lower gas fees. But really a lot of the times they just use the EVM except for Solana and just reduce gas fees or increase the size of the block space and didn't necessarily increase scalability very much, just made the fees cheaper and created actually just an unsustainable economy. And so said differently, the reason for existence for all L1s is their low gas fees. So they can't suddenly decide, hey, you know what, we're going to charge the right level of gas fees to become economically balanced now. Because if they did that, then there'd be no reason to use them. So they're kind of stuck in this spot where their economic balance is always negative. And then the token that they're issuing is less plausibly scarce than its main competitor, which is Ethereum and ETH. And so it will always be an inferior asset. And so it will always, it's kind of like looking at yen versus dollars, right? The yen has just been inflating massively for decades. And it's, if you just chart its value relative to dollars, it's it's been the slow down into the right curve. And there's a lot of currencies like that in the world. Now, Japan had their reasons for doing that. It's mainly to manipulate their competitiveness and the export markets. But there's going to be a lot of currencies that relate to Ethereum in that way. And it just kind of further goes to support this argument of, well, Ethereum is the kind of soundest money. It's the, the best money. And a lot of these other things kind of look less good in comparison, but they still behave like money. You know, there's plenty of currencies in the world, but the dollar is the reserve currency. It's number one, but, you know, the yen still exists. And the reason why it does is because the, the government is able to force people to pay taxes in it and, you know, transact in it locally. So I think the same will be true for a lot of these other L1s over time. And there will be a few that are just the power law winners. And, you know, the psychology around these types of money, you know, Bitcoin is a great example, builds on itself. Money is the strongest network affected piece of technology that has ever existed. And so Bitcoin, it has this lead, you know, people will argue is ETH going to flip Bitcoin. I actually thought that I was a stronger believer in the flipping before I did a lot of this research than I am now. Even though Bitcoin has questions around its security budget in the future, it has such a strong advantage in terms of culture. If you walk down the street tomorrow and you ask 100 people, what do you think of crypto? What is the token that you think of first? It's going to be Bitcoin. And so, you know, That's a really valuable place to be in. And I think it's going to continue to help solidify Bitcoin as money. But again, 
not necessarily at the exclusion of everything else, but probably as, you know, the number one thing that people around the world think of as, you know, an alternative to fiat. Very important factors, but also the ones that are the hardest to quantify uh, when you want to apply a value to something like Bitcoin. But and, and yeah, maybe this is a kind of a convenient byproduct of, of this analogy, but, you know, you don't really look at US dollars on a market cap basis. You know, there's there's M2, which is kind of a, an analysis of how many dollars there actually are out there. But when you're thinking about trading dollars for yen or euros, or when you're thinking about transacting it on a daily basis or holding it in your bank account, you're not necessarily thinking about, well, did the government print trillions of dollars in the last three years? Well, the answer is yes, but at least as far as I know, everyone in the US still holds dollars. Now that may be changing slowly, but the point there is, well, if you still have to pay taxes in dollars and you still have to buy your food in dollars and you still pay your rent in dollars, the sovereignty of that money in that region has the benefit of being able to kind of, you know, exist outside of these pure financial metrics because the network effect is already established. And so I think that's why a lot of these L1s are also are not valued in that way. Yeah, that's that's a great addition. Now, uh, to wrap the L1 section up, I want to quickly touch on the FAT protocol thesis, uh, which says that the value of the protocol layer will always grow faster than the value of the apps built on top of them. And that has been a somewhat defining concept for a value accrual in crypto. How do you see the relevance of this being challenged as we move towards more modular architectures? That's a great question. I think it's also one of the most interesting questions in crypto today. So my personal belief, I don't necessarily believe in the strong form FAT protocol thesis, which is to say that the value of all the dApps in sum is going to be less than the value of the L1 they're on. I'm not sure I believe that. I think that's you know, the strict theory, the sort of weak theory is that, you know, the L1 is going to be orders of magnitude more valuable than even the most valuable apps on top of it, but not necessarily all the apps in some. And it, it I, I don't think it's really that important of a distinction, to be honest, because I think that the end result is still, you know, the same in the sense that L1s are the most valuable things in crypto. And just to tell you why I think that's the case so far, and it's clearly the case in the data, if you look at, you know, 85% of all crypto values, L1s, and Bitcoin and ETH is like 75%. But the reason for that is you have these really strong network effects and a really strong moat around the successful L1s. So the network effects, like we were just talking about, one has to do with money and people holding it and, and viewing it as valuable. But then on the Ethereum level, it's also, well, the more dApps there are on the Ethereum execution layer, the more valuable it becomes for the N plus one app to join because then it could interact and have shared execution with all these other apps and have, you know, atomicity and all the rest that, you know, are these features that kind of create what is you, some of the things that are unique about crypto and DeFi. And so that network effect drives people to want to hold ETH to pay gas fees. And so that drives the value of the ETH token up. And obviously many, many dApps have tried to create something similar where you have to hold their governance token to transact. And it rarely works. People prefer the L1 token as the money, not the dApp token as the money. And I think over time that will become increasingly the case as general consumers are adopting crypto and want something that's easy to use. Now, there's a lot of different ways to abstract away from what token you're actually transacting in with the you know wallet technologies that are out there like account abstraction and the rest. But in any case, it's those features that have created this you know fat protocol scenario that we live in. How does modular blockchains change that? Well, I think that there's a couple of different layers to this, no pun intended. You've got the execution layer on the L2s, and then you've got what will become settlement and data availability on L1 layer. Today, the only things that actually exist like this are the L2s on Ethereum and then Ethereum itself. And my view is that most L2s will 
eventually kind of converge on things that look like dApps where they generate revenue, they pay Ethereum gas fees to use Ethereum for data availability, and there's limited network effects on the L2 execution layer. As a result, they kind of get squeezed in terms of their value, and that value gets exported down to the layer below it, which is the L1 or Ethereum. And Ethereum, because it's the base layer for many L2s, just is able to kind of siphon that value that's being created back to the L1. So I actually think that the modular thesis, for the most part, reinforces the existing trend with FAT protocols. There is a caveat, though, and the caveat is for L2s that become sovereign. And in that case, they're really not L2s, but they're just a sovereign execution layer. And so that gets into this idea of, well, if I can build an L2, an execution layer, rather, that has really strong network effects with a lot of dApps on it, that then is able to use multiple different types of data availability layers and isn't beholden to just one, then it can start to charge gas fees in its native token. And then it can just transact in whatever token it needs to for a particular DA layer. But if it's not enshrined in a particular DA layer, then if one DA layer gets too expensive and it's cheaper to go elsewhere, or you know, it's not captured by that DA layer in the same way that all the L2s are today on Ethereum. And so that's like kind of a future state where there's many different DA services available. You know, Celestia is launching soon. Eigen DA launching soon. You know, there's a couple of others in the works. So there will be competitors to Ethereum that a sovereign execution layer can use. And so then I think those execution layers actually can start to have monetary premium themselves. And then those as well may become that protocols. But in that case, they're not really L2s. They actually end up becoming kind of like their own L1s, except for they don't have their own validator set. They pay for someone else's validator set, but they have freedom in terms of which validator set they're basically renting, if you will. Yeah, definitely. And I think the follow-up piece to the original FAT protocol thesis paper by Joe Manegro was thin applications. And I feel that they kind of broke it down into a bit more detail, which better helps you understand now looking back at it, how the kind of modular architecture also fits into the work and data layer and how the in actual user interface or application layer just gets squeezed smaller and smaller as the competition intensifies. Yeah, I mean, you, you can see, you again can see that today because if you look at the level of fees that any DAP is able to charge, they're very limited because it's so easy to copy and paste those smart contracts and compete with them and undercut them on fees. You know, the beauty, on the one hand, the beauty of open source is that there's infinite potential for competition, which ends up compressing fees for the user at the app layer, which is good for the user, bad for the developer to try and create some sort of rent seeking business model. And so what ends up happening is all of that, all the margins that would have accrued at the app layer actually get pushed down onto the fat protocol layer. And that is seemingly more and more becoming like a law of physics in crypto. So I think you know, modularity doesn't necessarily change that. It just creates more dimensionality around where that value is going to accrue, but it, it's not going to make it like where in the modular stack that value is going to accrue, but it's, it's not going to somehow revert to the app layer. Now, centralized apps are different, right? If it's centralized, then it's not open source. It becomes much harder to, to copy. And that also kind of plays into what kind of multiples we're seeing at the DAP layer. And obviously we use token terminal to do a lot of this research, you know, DAP level application governance tokens, whatever you want to call them on a fully diluted market cap to revenue multiple actually are starting to converge on things that you would see like as high growth companies in the NASDAQ. And, you know, there's a reason for that. It's because those things are viewed more and more like companies and you know, they have to pay tax to the country below them, which is the L1. That is definitely true. Continuing on to more of the L2 landscape, what you just spoke about 
dApps and, and application-specific rollups and actually start with a question related to that because with more and more dApps starting to have incentives to create their own app-specific rollups, how do you see that changing the whole landscape and the flow of value accrual from the app layer to the fat protocol at the bottom? Yeah, well, I think the, the context here is that if you look at the life cycle of an application, it begins as a dApp on mainnet. It moves to an app-specific rollup. And then ultimately, it aspires to one day become a sovereign execution layer. And that's kind of like what we've seen in Cosmos with these app chains where, you know, DYDX said, hey, we can become our own chain. We're generating enough fees, like, let's do that. And, you know, there are legitimate engineering reasons to want to do that, but there's also very strong economic reasons for everything we've discussed today. And so I think the app specific rollup is kind of the middle ground. It's it's how you evolve from mainnet or L2 DAP to your own like you know execution layer. You have some of your own economic choices and design choices that could maybe one day lead you to becoming your own app chain or your own sovereign thing. And so I think it's very appealing to a lot of app developers to go this route. And so our view is there's going to be an explosion of L2s. A lot of them will be app specific L2s and it's going to be fascinating how it all plays out. And so we actually uh, co-led the seed round of a project called Dimension, which is the first app specific rollup chain uh, built in Cosmos. It's, It's also going to eventually use Ethereum for DA. It's starting out using Celestia's DA. Um, But we think that we're already seeing tons of app-specific rollups getting built there. So we think it's uh, a really interesting place that there will be a lot of growth in the future. You know, looking at that and the motivations of individual app developers, we think, well, there's going to be this explosion of L2s. And so the world is going to be filled with L2s and there's going to be lots of different kinds. And it will be really interesting to see how we can create a compelling user experience when you have so many of these different execution layers out there. Definitely. And as we have new L2s spawning all the time, and the kind of barrier to entry there is, or seems to be a lot lower than starting a completely new L1 ecosystem, and the economics behind an L2 are so different, how do the valuation methodologies adapt the ones that we kind of spoke about earlier in this episode related to L1s? How do they adapt to L2 blockchains? Yeah, I think the key question is whether it's sovereign or not. Because if the L2 is not sovereign, then you know, looking at the L2s today, let's take optimism as an example. It's charging gas fees in ETH. It's paying for data availability on ETH, in ETH, on Ethereum, in ETH. And so it has no ability to define its own monetary policy, right? It can't decide what it wants to pay ETH for security. ETH decides that. And so I think when you look at it that way, it's really just a spread business. It charges the users a certain amount in fees. It has to take a fraction of those fees and pay Ethereum for security. The spread is what the profits it generates. To us, we see that and we say, well, this, these governance tokens are just financial assets, right? It's owning a share of the spread that that L2 is able to generate. And things get more interesting when you can easily create many instances of optimism. And those, the spread from those instances also flow back to the token. Because then you get the potential for quite a lot of scale and a very valuable asset, but not something with monetary premium. And if you look at base, for example, I, th- I find it to be very interesting that Coinbase chose to pay optimism a 10% share of their fees, right? Which kind of sets this precedent in the world that when you use, you know, Bedrock, for example, as the basis for your new L2, you know, the right thing to do is kind of to share the fees with the, the treasury of optimism. And so, you know, it's kind of a way to protect against this, the fact that it's really easy, going to become really easy to spin up your own L2 and make sure that the originators continue to get some portion of those fees 
Whether most people do it or not is yet to be seen, but I do think it's pretty cool that Coinbase chose to do that. I think some projects will kind of force that and say, you know, you have a license with us to use our execution layer and thus you have to pay us 10% of your fees. We'll see. But in any case, I, I think if you're beholden to a single DA, you cannot have monetary premium because you're not sovereign and the token will ultimately trade as a financial asset. And, and that's definitely not how L2s are trading today. And it may be because the market is, whether the market in aggregate realizes this explicitly or not, doesn't really matter. But there's this embedded premium in these tokens that may be a result of the, the hope that one day they do become sovereign. Because there's not anything that will keep optimism from becoming sovereign from Ethereum in the way that I described. If it can build a strong enough ecosystem and network effects on its own execution layer, then it could very well choose to become sovereign. And then boom, you know, OP ends up looking like a monetary asset. And everyone who was middle curving it now saying that the fees are going to compress over time will, will end up being wrong. But it's yet to be seen. So I think it's another fascinating question and we'll see it play out over the next few years. That's a really interesting take there. And given the quite substantial fee spread that a lot of these L2s are realizing, and now we're seeing these new revenue streams, the treasuries come in from like base to optimism, and there being no explicit value accrual mechanisms for these L2 tokens out there at all yet. Do you think that best way to accrue value to the token is going sovereign. So what you just mentioned there, or do you see that there'll be other strategies that play out before we see that happening for uh, value accrual to L2 tokens? That's a good question. I think different projects will take different approaches. I think the leaders today have the benefit of not needing to pay out their treasury to drive value to their token. I think there's enough people who believe in the potential for them to become sovereign or money-like that they're going to kind of suspend this belief around value accrual and and continue to hold the token at a, at a high price. I think other longer tail L2s may end up experimenting with that. But I also think that this argument that, you know, this is what the optimism team has said is, you know, they think about the highest value use of the spread they're making as being able to use it to reinvest into the network and grow the network. So they may be thinking one day, yeah, we're going to try and become sovereign. And so we want to take all this spread and reinvest it as much as we can. But, and look, many network effect marketplace type companies have been very successful playing that game. I mean, look how long Amazon built itself up for it. It, it was two decades of that before it really started distributing any, you know, generating any real kind of operating cash flow. So, you know, I, I think there's wisdom to that, but it certainly looks like today it's a tough valuation to come in at unless you believe this sovereignty argument based on how we see the world. You know, we may not be right, but this is kind of the framework that we've built to try and understand the L1s and L2s and, and the other DApps tokens for that matter. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Valuations, when you just look at them and try to build up any sort of method to quantify that value is is very tough. Look, look, the reason why it's so easy to middle curve crypto as someone who has a background in traditional finance and, you know, kind of like rigorous underwriting of assets is because there's this specter of monetary premium kind of that it always exists there as a potential. And so when you try and reduce things to financial assets, you can be proven wrong as the world starts to see them more like money and they escape these kind of traditional valuation bounds that a more financial asset would have. Which by the way, is, is one of the reasons why we built our venture strategy in the way that we have, which is we look at the potential for monetary premium in these networks as being you know, the most power law kind of long tail upside opportunities that exist. And so from a venture investor, particularly, you know, an LP's perspective, that's a really attractive exposure to try and get very precision access to. I love how clear the frameworks are through which you kind of 
approach this space you have so much clarity of thought in the way you think of these l1 and l2 networks that's that's so refreshing to see that's nice of you just to, to say i mean it's cer certainly not something that we came up with overnight it's just a lot of discussion and investment committee with the team and you know looking at it from different angles but you know we'll see if that ends up being right but certainly we think you know we have enough conviction in the way that we see the world that you know we're, we're putting our money where our mouths are and I like that because there's there's been, especially related to the monetary premium aspect of the value, I think even us internally, we, we've tried to avoid using the term like currency and anything related to crypto anymore. When, if you look at media, it's always referred to as cryptocurrency. And when you think of crypto as a whole, we feel that's very, very misleading. We always try to speak about crypto assets. But at the same time, when you speak purely about crypto assets, it may be forced a lot of people to kind of minimize the whole monetary aspect of them, these L1 tokens. So there's a slight paradox there as well in how these should actually be referred to. So, you know, understanding Token Terminal's product, which is really trying to understand these companies that exist on chain from a fundamental perspective, it totally makes sense that you would take that approach because, you know, that's the value you guys are adding. And I think you guys are doing an amazing job. And I think referring to crypto as a currency turns a lot of people off. And I think it turns a lot of people off because, you know, they, they dismiss this thing offhand because they're like, Dogecoin is a joke, you know, and what is this Shiba thing and some guy driving a McLaren with a Doge stickers all over it. Like no one thinks about that as something that's like a legitimate investable asset that, you know, someone would sit there and study. It, it feels just totally like this degen thing. And I think that takes away from crypto a lot that there's that mentality and there's that particular type of community. But at the same time, I think that's kind of the byproduct of something like that's very, very new and potentially very transformative that also is very culturally different. And so it's going to take a long time, I think, for that to change. But I think that's the nature of something like this. Like this has not existed for humanity in the past. You have to really try hard to draw analogies to things that have happened in the past with what we're seeing with crypto. And I think it's also going to be a slow burn. It's going to take a long time for it to really get to where we think it can be because it's so disruptive and culturally different. It's, it's like, you know, our parents' generation do not have the same relationship with technology as we do. So the younger generations, the millennials, the Zs, et cetera, like they are much more comfortable with that, this idea of money existing as a digital object. Imagine the, the children today who are, you know, five years old, what they're going to think of crypto as in the next couple of decades, it's going to be completely different from how the boomers think about it. And eventually all that financial value is going to trickle down to the newer generations and the newer generations are going to perceive crypto differently. And they're going to be, I think, you know, part of the forcing function that drives a lot larger percentage of the population of, of the world to hold these things and you know think of them as legitimate currencies yeah definitely and i think that's actually a great note to end on the fact that this has never happened before and all that me you and the teams we work with can keep doing is trying to demystify this internet native economy and help investors users and anybody else out there a bit confused looking in to better understand what is going on and you guys are doing a great job at that thank you so much for joining me on this pod today to share your insights and your approach to the market. It was super insightful and there's still a lot of stuff that we should dig into together, I feel. And I'm really looking forward to be able to do that again at some point in the future. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. Definitely check out the blog if you're interested in more of what we have to say. Thank you all for listening. And I'm going to start doing a, a regular sort of short video overview of different projects and posting that. So keep an eye on that. And, you know, would love to chat with you again about, you know, how we think about dApps and our valuation frameworks for those as well. Yep. 100%. Looking forward to that. Thank you.